This episode of Dopey is brought to you by our very good friends at Oro Recovery. Not Aloe, but Oro, located in sunny Southern California. Created by our friend Bob Forrest and his friends, Evan, Jared, and Bob, to create a treatment center that helps alcoholics and addicts by using compassion and connection rather than control. They have decades of experience, many decades of experience, in treating co-occurring mental health disorders, including severe mental illness. They make sure that your kick, your detox, is as comfortable as possible, which is great. They have amenities you wouldn't believe. The surfing, the sound bath meditation, the equine therapy, the potentially spiritually transformative sweat lodge, and so much more. But you don't go to treatment for the amenities. You go because Oro is going to treat you like a person. I have friends that have been there. They've all said they're treated amazing. If you're fucked and you're willing to go to sunny Southern California, I highly suggest going to Oro. This episode of Dopey is brought to you by our friends at Soberlink. At Soberlink, somebody cares about your recovery. Unfortunately, relapse is so common, especially when it comes to alcohol, because it is widely available and highly prevalent in many social settings. That's why having true accountability and a deterrent from drinking is so important for staying sober. Soberlink has been empowering and helping people with alcohol use disorder since 2011 and is trusted by hundreds of treatment facilities. The Soberlink system consists of a portable handheld device that documents proof of sobriety in real time, keeping you connected to your family, friends, sponsor, treatment professional, recovery coach, or anyone else who worries about your well-being. As an exclusive offer to our listeners, email info at Soberlink.com and mention Dopey for 50 bucks off your device. You do it for that someone who cares to help you to stay off of the sauce. Check them out at Soberlink.com slash Dopey. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by our old friends at Brainwashed Coffee. And their coffee is delicious. And they're from Port Chester, New York, and that's where I went to college. So I love brainwashed coffee. They also give 50% of all of their profits to people and movements around recovery, which is amazing. But they have a new mug. It's a beautiful pink and black mug made by Mir, perfect for hot and cold coffee. The lining will not affect the flavor of your favorite brainwashed brew. It's leak-free, insulated, BPA-free, and again, it's pink with the black logo. The Dopey 20 code is still active for 20% off coffee orders, and we added a special code for your listeners. Recovery Mug, valid all recovery month for 5 bucks off the mug. Codes can be combined for huge savings. That's brainwashedcoffeeco.com. And finally... And most importantly, this episode of Dopey is brought to you by listeners like you. In the Dopey Nation, through the power and passion and pain and pathos of Dopey Patreon. It's www.patreon.com slash Dopey Podcast. And I have to say, the more you guys participate in Patreon, the more Dopey can exist in the world. And I'm just pumping a lot of stuff into Patreon. There's new videos up. There's new music up. There's exciting graphics up. Patreon is a new hub of dopey stuff. So join Patreon and help us keep dopey dopier. Thank you. Also, we have amazing new gear in the works. There's a new dead-based fucking hoodie, a new dead-based t-shirt, long sleeve. It looks pretty nice. 
Go to dopeypodcast.com. Check it out. There's new shit coming out all the time. I still have a shitload of these dopey trucker hats. If you are considering buying one, please buy one. Venmo me money, and I will send it to you. I have the classic dopeys. I have the Oyve snapbacks. Just Venmo me like 25 bucks for the hat, 30 bucks if you want stickers. Venmo is Dopey Podcast. Make sure to include your address. And most importantly, if you buy any Dopey gear, make sure you post it somewhere or send me a picture because it makes people think that we're cool because you guys look cool in the gear. Anyway, enough with the ad. Here is the fucking show. And welcome to Dopey, the podcast on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. And I'm Dave, and I'm thrilled to have a guest at my dad's house, the lovely and talented Aaron Carr, author, advice columnist, mother, and wife. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And it's cool that you could just come up from the village, and and here we are. It's so exciting, especially, you know, the last 18 months of, like, not really... Being able to do anything in person, this is very, very cool. Right, and Aaron was on our panel. We just did a yes. panel for overdose. Was it for Overdose Awareness Day? Yes. And it was like a lot of harm reduction stuff. And there's a lot of weird. There's a lot of. There's an undercurrent of weird harm reduction stuff going on in the Dopey Nation. Yes. There was a huge feud between some of the people who are using or like smoking weed or whatever, right. and then some of the twelve steppers are like, and there's a feud. Wow. It's yeah, t- you know, that's where I just, you know, it goes back to the thing for me, that, like the bottom line is your recovery is none of my business and vice versa. And how's your life? My life is great. No, I mean, I mean like, how's anyone's oh, life? Like, right, if they right, have right. fun. I know <laughs> I your mean, life my is life. Great. How's your life, Aaron? <laughs> right, I mean, it doesn't matter. Like, it really, it's interesting. I think that that happens a lot in, when people are in certain recovery communities where they think like, well, no, this is the answer and it's the only answer. And, and that's the thing that I've learned you know, now it's like 18 and a half years of being in sustained recovery. It's that, amazing. That it really, it's not always going to be what you think it looks like. And you just have to find what works for you. Well, I think of Dopey as the Unitarianism yes. of recovery. <laughs> we let them all in. All denominations. We talk about all everything and everyone's welcome. And it's funny, I was talking to my friend and producer Sam about you yesterday. Mm-hmm. And she, he was like, I think she has a lot of time. Mm-hmm. And I was like... I don't think she has that much time. And he was like, no, I think she has a lot of time. And I was like, I think she has like 12 years. And I finished the book this morning and I was like, holy shit, she does have a bunch of time. Yeah, yeah. And the last time you used was before, it was like at the very beginning of your pregnancy. Yes. So it was in 2000, the beginning of 2003. I knew I was pregnant. I had to find a doctor who would detox me because I didn't want to go on methadone and give birth on methadone and have my kid go through that. Um, I'm not saying that's not the right choice for some people. It's just something that I didn't want to do. I had never been on methadone. And at the time they were first starting to treat people with buprenorphine. And so I found a doctor, actually a friend of mine found a doctor for me who over seven days used buprenorphine to detox me and I never used again. Yeah. Which is incredible, which is like the miracle of yeah. par- of parenthood yeah. when it works because it yeah. obviously it doesn't work all the time no. and i'm jumping around a little bit i don't usually okay. jump i'm not usually <laughs> like one who jumps around i usually am very chronological <laughs> but i know you had a ton of shame around that oh yeah Do yeah you still no not at all no i really don't because you know that shame was not serving me in any way shape or form and, and i realized like when i finally told my parents because uh, I went through something with my ex-husband because he knew and he tried to use that like to hold it over my head and he told my parents before I did and to kind of get them to question whether or not I was sober and I finally just told everyone and I thought you know when I did that they were all gonna like hate me and and no you know they would look at me differently and I mean maybe somebody did maybe some people looked at me differently but I didn't feel that acute shame anymore. And then it allowed me to just kind of be open about it more and more and more and more. And then obviously, by the time I started writing about it, I had already been pretty open about it with everyone in my life. So it was pretty easy to write about. I hear you. One of my favorite things you said in the book was at the very end. And you say that opiate addicts, the only way to get past it is to go through. Mm -hmm. And I think with this, that's 
so true. Like, like, and same with me. Like I felt, I mean, I think I felt a lot of shame Mm -hmm. about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like as a man with a kid, I I don't, you know, it's not inside of me. So like, I didn't really feel connected to Mm -hmm. the fetus Mm -hmm. or, or even the, the baby, my first baby. Like I was like, it might as well have been a cat because it couldn't talk. It couldn't really do anything. And she, my, I should say she, Nora, my beautiful (laughs) daughter. Um, but I didn't think about it. And, and, and then once I had the ability to feel shame, it Mm -hmm. was like, am I going to let this shame run me? And I did for a while, Mm -hmm. but then no, I'm going to put my head down and live. And then if you do that 18 and a half years later, you can sit in this strange Jewish man's kitchen and say, I have no shame. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I don't. And you know, it's funny because people still react to it. Obviously, you know, reading the book or, or making comments. I get emails sometimes from people that are like really nasty and all I can think. What do they say that's nasty? Oh, they say things like, oh, you should have died. Like it, we, the world would have been a better place if you had died. No, no. Like, you know, you're like a spoiled junkie, like all these kinds of things. Oh, about like, you know, how I, you know, or bring up the fact that I did drugs when I was pregnant. And I just think to myself, like, it just says a lot more about their character than it does mine. I'm not hiding anything. You know, I, jo- I always joke that like I could run for office because I don't have any skeletons in my closet because I've let them out. There's like nothing anybody could find on me because I've already told everyone about it. And that's a really empowering place to be because, you know, it's if they want to carry that shame for me, go be my guest. I don't have it anymore. Like you want to carry it around. Okay. But another thing in the book that that this reminds me of is there was a fictionalized boyfriend that we'll call Pete. Yes. <laughs> and 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 uh, Aaron and Pete had been through a ton of stuff. Mm-hmm. You and you and Pete had yes. been through a ton of stuff, and and you were in therapy with him, mm-hmm. and you kind of describe him knowing the worst shit about you mm-hmm. and the best shit about mm-hmm. you. And like when you talk about like, I don't think you're going to run for office. Right. But like, I don't think I am. Either. But like you might have let the skeletons out of the closet. But anyone that doesn't know you, they don't know that. No. Nobody yeah. knows anything. Right. So it's like when they meet you, like if like whatever, my aunt shows up and mm-hmm. you're like, hi, my name is Aaron. Right. I did heroin when, right. when Atticus was in my belly. <laughs> that would be information from my right. aunt Gail right. that you didn't share. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, so like. The skeletons might be out of the closet, but we, st- I mean, like I wear it like that too. I think right. I like to shock people with it mm-hmm. because it's like, I think in your situation, it's like, fuck them. Atticus is in school. Yeah. Can I, can I disclose anything about him? I mean, he's, he's a great kid. He was a ballet dancer for a long time and I'm not going to tell you, I mean, I'll tell you, but like, I don't want to say what school he's at just to protect his anonymity a little bit, but obviously his name is in the book. You know, but he's a he's a good kid. We have a really good relationship, and he broke his elbow yesterday he did, playing frisbee. <laughs> I also love the way you talk about one of my favorite things about the book. I really enjoyed the book. Thank you. The book like made me think of, like I like the book because it made me think about me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you know. I honestly like that's why we make art, right? Whether it's writing or films or music or a painting. The whole point of art is like to have human connection. The reason that we respond to like if we look at something and we respond to it, even if it's abstract, we're responding to like a reflection of the experience of being a human being. Right. That's what it is. So that's why that's why people that's why you feel a connection to it, because you feel a reflection in it. Right. And I think that's a beautiful thing. That's why we do it. Not to mention, we're both 47 years old. Yes. We're both, like, junkies. Yes. We're both into 90210. Totally. Like, that's a lot right there. Yeah. To be the same year, yeah. to both be born in 1974, yeah. is, like, serious. I was actually born in the end of 73. Well, then it doesn't I'm, count. It's I'm all, older it's all right. than you. You're, I feel much better about myself. That's great. <laughs> you, you can. You can. I, I feel terrific. <laughs> but, um... I think the beginning of the book, you open up the book where Atticus asks you mm-hmm. about using mm-hmm. and then you close it with that. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed that. And I really enjoy Like I told, see, this is a, I don't know if I don't feel shame about this, mm-hmm. but I feel disappointed that my older daughter, her mm-hmm. name is Nora. She's 11. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I didn't use heroin. I, I used heroin a little bit. Mm-hmm. In my mind, I didn't use heroin. Right. I used to use a little bit of heroin right. until she was like, let's see, if I have six years and she's 11 until she was five. five. So, like, she doesn't get 
when I celebrate an anniversary, mm-hmm. she, I, I can see her doing the math and be mm-hmm. like, oh, fuck. You know, he must have been using when I was alive. And I, I feel a little sad about that. But you know what? But she also gets to see an example of how her dad had the courage to get recovery, even though he had stumbled a lot. And like, to me, that's the more important example. That's something you said at the end Mm -hmm. when you're talking to Atticus Mm -hmm. and you're talking to the audience and you kind of say that one of the reasons that I'm public about it in in a way is so that people know that they can fail, but Mm -hmm. still succeed. Yeah. Which is true until somebody dies. And then they can't. That's what I always say. I mean, you know, it's why to me, harm reduction is so important. The only bottom you can't recover from is death. That's the only bottom you can't recover from. And, you know, you and I both have lost, I don't, like, I don't even count less people. And, you know, we're really fucking lucky that we're here. Can I swear on this show? No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know, I know that was probably obvious, but I've done that before on a podcast where they had to bleep me and then I felt bad. <laughs> no, I curse. I curse <laughs> okay. so much that it's a problem. <laughs> Because it's like it's like a character defect mm-hmm. that I need to use the word fucking like mm-hmm. lubrication to my thoughts. I know. I understand. I do it all the time. It's re- it's a really bad habit of mine. Do you do it? Do, Atticus can handle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I about mean, the younger one? Oh, yeah, he's heard me curse. <laughs> I try not to do it in front of him. Well, if like Nora walks in, I'm like, hello, welcome to Dopey, the podcast on drugs, addiction and dumb mm-hmm. shit. Mm-hmm. Half of the fucking um merch says fucking toodles for Chris right. on it. and it's like and I don't and, I, and if she curses I'm like I like freak out she doesn't curse she's right. like a good kid yeah um but what were we talking about we were talking about, about failure and letting people know that like you can succeed again and that like, I mean, even if you failed and that's why I talk about you know one of the things that I think is like important in the book and when I speak is how many times I relapsed and being really open about that because I think that even amongst other people who are in recovery, there's stigma around relapse. Totally. I mean, it's very much like, oh, you lost your time. And it's, and it's, it's sick. It's like, yeah. it's really like self-esteem based on somebody else's failing or yes. like, or fear or because, and I, and I, I can't say that I don't have a piece of me. I, I mean, like, and this is a little bit macabre or mm-hmm. dark or not cool. But um, when I got into 12 step, like somebody had more time than me mm-hmm. and I was like annoyed, like that I w- they would always have more time than me. Right. And then they relapsed. It was actually my sponsor. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I didn't like him. He was like this weird sponsor guy who mm-hmm. trolled me like my first day. Oh, no. And he's like, can I sponsor you? Oh, that's, that's odd. Well, he said, can I sponsor you? Right. I'll get you through all 12 steps in a year. Mm-hmm. And I was like, great, I was mm-hmm. like, let's do it. And he was weird. And if I called him for anything, he would be like, call somebody else. Mm-hmm. And then he wound up relapsing. And I thought that was God's way of doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. <laughs> um, my first sponsor, when I, because I'm not in 12-step programs anymore, but when I was my first sponsor, she was a sex worker and a bank robber. And she was, the thing that I loved about her is when she spoke about her past, she did it without shame. And that's what I was attracted to because I was like, I need, I need somebody that's not going to judge me. And I knew she wouldn't judge me. Right. A bank robber and a sex worker. Mm -hmm. Sounds incredible. How is she now? She's, I mean, I think I've lost touch with her, but I think she's fine. I think that's interesting in itself that you started out in 12 step. Mm -hmm. You have 18 and a half years Mm -hmm. of sobriety, abstinence, Mm -hmm. whatever. When did you stop with 12 step? When I was pregnant when I, I, so I didn't, I didn't really get recovery in the room. Not a toe. I mean, I had like, I would, I think the most time that I ever got in the rooms was like 10 months. The first time I tried and then I relapsed and that's when I overdosed. So like in 18 and a half years, right? Like I know, like I, I like did NA, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I relapsed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when I started getting some time in Mm -hmm. another fellowship, Mm -hmm. we won't say, we'll say it rhymes (laughs) with Ray, Ray, but I would go back to NA just to be like, look at me. Cause I've got time. Mm-hmm. You never went to a meeting and like, you know, raise your hand. I got 10 years, no, whatever. I mean, but I'm still, you know, I actually, I have been to meetings in the last 18 years, like to support somebody else. And I'm still friends with a lot of people who are in, in, in 12 step programs. I don't have anything against them. They laid the foundation for me. Um, and a lot of people I know that got sober around the same time that I did, 
they are either still in AA or they're not, but they're fine. Like some of them smoke pot, some of them don't. You know, it's kind of all over the place. Um, did it annoy the shit out of you? What? 12 step. No. You can say you can say it here. It, it Nobody's re- really listening. It's okay. <laughs> it really didn't. I wasn't I was not it's not like it was even a conscious decision to not. It's just that I it had to have been a conscious decision to not. I though. mean, well, here's the thing is that I had been relapsing so much. I was pregnant. Everybody fucking knew I was lying, you know? So I had so much shame about all the people I knew, program people I knew, knowing that I was pregnant and using drugs. I just felt so ashamed to go back. So I did, I mean, my one of my dearest friends who really helped me at the time in the book, she's Danica. She, I mean, she's been sober. God, I mean, she's got to be, now it's probably like 30 years. She had a lot of sobriety then. And I like stayed at her house all the time. And she, I was around people who were in the program. I just wasn't going to meetings. And then after I had Atticus is when I really started focusing on getting, you know, mental health help and addressing trauma and seeing a psychiatrist and then finding a spiritual path for myself that I hadn't had before, which first started for me in yoga, which is like that I can't even believe that it started there because that's not really my personality. But you needed it and it came to you. I I needed to learn how to sit in my body. It's like that. When I look at it, like what I learned in Kundalini yoga when Atticus was a baby, it was like I needed to learn how to breathe and sit in my body and be comfortable just sort of being in my body. How much do you do a lot of Kundalini yoga still? No. Was that like the... (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot of it. It's all about breath. It's like holding postures and breath. And usually at the end of a Kundalini yoga class, they do the gong. And I don't know. It was like the most amazing thing for me because I was never somebody who was able to like silence the dialogue in my brain. And that gong did it. Like I could be still and like not have thoughts in a hamster wheel in my head. Did you ever see Woodstock, the documentary Woodstock? No. You've never seen no. the doc? You- I've seen pieces of it. I've never watched the whole thing. Oh, you have to watch it. There's this hippie like who's giving this big kundalini yeah. class to like hundreds of hippies. Mm-hmm. And he's like, <laughs> yeah. So what we're talking, he's like, so what we're talking about, man, is the kundalini. Mm-hmm. And if you do it right, it's going to be like a lightning bolt that shoots up your spine like DMT, man. You, know, <laughs> you have to watch this movie. Will you watch it? Yes, I will. I mean, I've seen, it's not like I'm not aware of it or haven't seen clips from it, but I've never sat down and watched it from beginning to end. You see, when we bef- went, before we started recording, Aaron and I were talking about like, we both lived in California, mm-hmm. like Aaron grew up in California, mm-hmm. but she lived in my neighborhood there yeah. at the same age. Yeah. And she's like, I'm surprised we didn't meet. And yeah. I was like, I was like at Woodstock. I was like watching TV my whole life. <laughs> I like didn't leave the building. But I'm just surprised we didn't run into each other buying drugs. <laughs> but we might have. Yeah, that's you know, true. I mean, I wasn't like looking for people. No, uh, I wasn't either. But I mean, like I wasn't like, yeah. I just, I didn't know. Do, you, do yeah. I look familiar? Maybe I mean, a little bit, you right? Do. Yeah, you look yeah. familiar to me yeah. too. I'm sure we did. Yeah. But I was copying when I was in in California mm-hmm. in Echo Park, I would just literally wake up at four in the morning mm-hmm. every day and go down to Sixth Street, Sixth and Bonnie Bray. Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Just walk that walk that square. So, like a little bit before you were there, like like when I first started using again after like I had been off of heroin for a while. Um, I it was literally like you just drive down Sixth Street, make a left on Bonnie Bray, and pull up in front of that donut shop, and somebody would come to your car and you'd roll down your window. Amazing, it's great. And then that kind of stopped, but there were like there were these older ladies that would sell tamales sure. at night, and like if you would go there, you could buy heroin, and then there were always people around. And I mean, I had so many different dealers, and oh god, <laughs> just like I, you know. But yeah, that was a, that whole area is like a hotbed for, and there'd be like a crack block, heroin block, fake ID block. Well, the crack block I thought was East, like St. Julian or whatever. St. Andrews. Right. St. Andrews. I had a crack dealer that lived on St. Andrews and third or St. Andrews and sixth. And, and, uh, but then also like sometimes like things would have been swept and like you could find crack, but no heroin, which was a total nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> I I wasn't buying. I didn't. I don't think I did coke once in LA. I didn't do crack once. I didn't. I did. I, I just got pills. Yeah, and heroin. Just oh, that's it. I ha- I went through that crack relapse. I know so bad. That, but that's a good. That's a good story. <laughs> I was gonna ask you. I was gonna ask you first. 
like around the time when you got sober, what I got out of the story mm-hmm. in the book was that you were so connected to 12 step group mm-hmm. to outpatient group to a recovery scene that like it was so shitty by the time you got pregnant, you were like, I don't want to be around it. I just, I just felt so ashamed. I felt like I couldn't, like I almost like needed like a fresh start, you know? And that was, you know, that's not the problem of the 12 step meetings. That's like my shit. And then, you know, maybe a little bit of people who are around then. It's also just that the, I think the phenomenon of being young Mm -hmm. and like around young people in a pseudo social setting. Mm -hmm. So it it, it undoes a lot of the spiritual aspect and it adds a very much of a social aspect. Yeah. And it's like, and it fucks, it fucks you up. I mean, I only went to meetings at seven 30 in the morning. Right. So like there was none of that. It was just like before work. It was never like in the evening to get home. I was at home watching TV in the evening. I couldn't do it. Mine was like, you know, I was going to like cafe tropical. I was, I went to that spot. I went to that spot one time and I was like, I just felt like, I I felt like I was not cool. Like I had to get out of there. That was like, I mean, I went that my very first meeting was at the log cabin on Robertson, which is like a famous meeting place. And I mean, you know, when I first started going to meetings, I was 23 and I needed like, I needed like, somewhere to find like this new social structure. So it was good in a way, but it was also bad because, you know, like as a young woman walking into like, it felt like a feeding frenzy in terms of like, there were a lot of predatory people in, in the rooms then. And like, not, you know, it's, you know, whatever it's all, it was all about, they just wanted to have sex. And like, I was young and wanted to have sex too. But now like looking back and I'm like, Oh, that's just so gross. (laughs) Well, but you can't, I mean, I don't, I don't look not, at not it like, gro- not gross because of the sex, but just like to like when somebody comes into the rooms with like 28 days or 30 days, like let them like, it's find unfortunate. some friends first. It's you know? unfortunate yeah. that like you come in young and like attractive mm-hmm. and like fucked up. Yeah. It's like, of course. And then there's right. this whole network of people like that want to have sex with you right. or that you, or that want to be your friend. Right. And, and like, there's these components that you're not ready for. It's a lot like school mm-hmm. in like a weird, but it's it like is. school for total fuck ups. You, so it, you started using when you were 13. Mm-hmm. Like that has, you, you shot heroin at yeah. 13. 10 days after my 13th birthday. Crazy. Right. I look at 13 year olds now and I, I'm shocked. The fucked up thing, right? And this is weird because I have an eleven year old. Mm-hmm. Year old, you have a, and I have a three year old. You have an eighteen year old or mm-hmm. n- almost nineteen year old. No, he just turned eighteen. Yeah. Wow, happy yeah. birthday! Uh, <laughs> and you have like a six year old, four year old, four year old. Yeah, I'm great. <laughs> My research is fucking spot on. But it's like, and this is just sad. This is sad. Like imagining a thirteen year old who shoots dope now. Yeah, it's fucking heartbreaking. I think of that like you know, I. <sighs> Somebody, you know, of course, people like often ask, like, what would you go back and tell like that young person? And like, really, like the biggest thing is like, I, I had so much self hatred then, and like now I have so much empathy for the young version of me that really didn't know that that she wasn't a monster, that she wasn't like just this broken, horrible person that like if people knew what she really felt would like run in disgust I really felt that I really really thought like if people knew what was going on inside my head that they would not you know it's like that primal thing like if if they knew x they won't love me right and and where I mean I know that do you think that was born in this in sexual trauma yeah I mean I think you know I was sexually abused when I was a kid and I didn't tell anyone by the babysitter no it was the, by the friend it, down the it, street it was, the brother it was an or something? Ad- adolescent son of family right, friends of right. ours so, you know, and then like it was confusing because I mean, he wasn't an adult, he was an adolescent, but you know, I was 4. Either way. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really you know, matter. But in my head, like over the years I did that so much, right? Like I tried to minimize it. I'm like, well, at least he was, you know, technically a kid too and like it wasn't it wasn't that bad. At least I wasn't related to you know, but it really fucked me up. I still process this shit in therapy and I'm like, "Oh my god. Like how long I don't know. I mean, I think that sometimes with like that early childhood trauma, it's kind of stuff that maybe you process your whole life. And in some ways that sounds really daunting. And then in other ways, it's a relief because you don't have to have it all figured out. It's okay that it's not all resolved. 
it can't. I mean, it's, it's never going to be resolved. Yeah. It's like anything that happens to you, you need to deal with it for yeah. the rest of your life. You know, if it's, you know, and oh, my mother was pretty overbearing. Mm-hmm. I have, and this is something I don't, I don't. My wife is convinced, and this is fucked up. I'm probably gonna take this out of the show, <laughs> but my wife is convinced that I was like sexually mm-hmm. abused or sexually molested, mm-hmm. and like I have weird memories that mm-hmm. don't make sense, mm-hmm. and. Like I had a memory of of being a little boy mm-hmm. and like hooking up with another little boy, mm-hmm. and I've never said this on Dopey's. So right. This is like cra- crazy right. revelatory information. And then I contacted the little. I ran into the little boy mm-hmm. at Katz's, mm-hmm. and as a man, right? You know? And I and I asked him if he remembered that me and him used to fool around when right. we were four years old or whatever. Right. He was like, no, I don't remember that at all. But he told me that he was molested at that camp. But what if I was the one that molested him? No, 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 no. no. Because two, it would be, it's not abnormal for two four-year-olds to fool around. Right. Like, I think I was four and he was three, or I was five and he was four. That that age group, it's not, that's not abnormal. But there is a high likelihood that if you were doing that, maybe somebody who was an adult was doing that to you. I mean, you know, I, I don't think, I think that, you know, I've never met, that doesn't mean they don't exist, but I've never met a female identifying heroin addict who wasn't raped or sexually abused and a lot a high percentage of men I know who were heroin addicts had some sort of childhood trauma or sexual abuse that doesn't mean for everybody obviously there's plenty of people who who have addictions that weren't sexually abused but it is there is a very high percentage that there and I think with early childhood trauma the thing that's so fucked up is you know, I talk about this in the book. It's like trauma doesn't record in the same way in our brain. So it took me a long time to even figure it out. You know, I knew that like he had been really mean to me and I didn't like him, but it wasn't really until I saw him like by chance when I was 19 that like it all kind of like made sense. And I still, my memories of what happened, like there's some things like details that are very clear. And then there's huge gaps because I was so young and because it was really traumatic our brains protect us by kind of like dispersing the information all over the place. And then it's like this jigsaw puzzle and you have to figure out how to put it back together. See, I don't, I don't think that I'll ever get to the bottom, mm-hmm. you know, cause I actually reached out to the kid and mm-hmm. he said it was a counselor in the camp and he was my counselor. I have no recollection of anything. I mean, you could do EMDR. What is EMDR? EMDR is a specific <clears throat> type of therapy, like for trauma. And you kind of, what is it exactly? They, they use either light or sound, like left, right, left, right. So if it's light, then you'd have your eyes open. If it's sound, it would be back and forth in like headphones. And you kind of go back to like a time and place and then just see what comes up. And it's kind of amazing what comes up. You've done it? Mm-hmm. I, I started doing it again this year <laughs> because I was having, you know, like even this far into recovery, like I still have, it's not like I'm, you know, everything just got solved. I still am. You know, it's for me, like active recovery is about like staying on top of my mental health. And I was feeling really sort of that thing where like for me, I shut down and like kind of disassociate when it comes to like physical intimacy and sort of just disassociate even with just like general affection with people. And so then I know that that means that there's something going on and I need to kind of. And that's in interesting because the disassociation is what we're so after when we're yeah. using. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's interesting. And, um, and you had sex very early on too. The same night. The same, same guy. First time, the guy yeah. shot you up. And, yes. <laughs> the first time I did heroin, I had sex. Yeah. Which of course, you know, I mean, like that's like a psychologist field day. Probably, right? You tell me, I'm sure you've seen a lot of psychologists. <laughs> yeah. They're like, Oh, tell me more. I mean, there's definitely, you know, there's obviously like there's, there's sort of, for me, there's there's a connection there because there, because you know I think as a young person, especially as a young woman, something happens when you're like sort of an adolescent and and, and be kind of like going from like girl to woman, where you start to realize that your body and your sexuality is currency, right? Like that, I I started to realize that I could use sexuality or sex to kind of get what I want or to get validation. Um, but then I also, there was like a dual message, social message that like, you should be ashamed of it too. Right. Like 
your value is in your sexuality, but you should also be ashamed of it. And how does that work? Like, I understand the first part, mm-hmm. but when does the shame get added I to the mix? I think that's just a social thing. I mean, I think to a certain extent, that's a social thing. I think a lot of young women struggle with um, recognizing that sort of like the messaging that we have culturally is is on their value sexually, right? In terms of like what we see in media. And then, but then there's also this like, equal voice of like slut shaming in media right you know right so like you can manipulate get what you want based on how you look or whatever mm-hmm. but at the same time that makes you a bad person yeah right. which is really like i mean it's, it's pretty it's loaded. really fucked up and i think that that's obviously that's changing changing you know but i think that it's um you know and, and certainly like young boys and and people of other genders like are dealing with other issues based on like whatever messaging they're getting socially but i think that there is something i can only ex- speak from my experience as a young woman like that's you know and that's not a conscious thought that i had then but now looking back i really see how that was the period of time like between 11 and 13 i went from like 5 feet to 5 foot 8 and i looked older and you know, I started getting attention from boys and from older guys and real, realized like that there was power in that. Right. And for somebody who felt so powerless, powerless from like being abused and then, you know, hiding all of like sort of my panic attacks and depression and everything from my family. I liked that. I liked that I had some ability to manipulate or to get something that I wanted, which was the validation. Right. And um, between like 13 Mm -hmm. and and kind of later, you weren't like this crazy junkie. No. Um, And you weren't in like most of these kinds of stories or many stories, having spoken to so many drug addicts Mm -hmm. just doing the podcast, you know, like that's where they get Adderall or Ritalin Mm -hmm. or like they become strung out on this or that. That's not what happened with you, really. No. I mean, I, I started so I did heroin and then I started doing it like I was doing it on weekends. Right. I mean, just it wasn't teen, teen partying like I as, mean, just but it was really just with the boyfriend. Right. Like it wasn't like my friends didn't even know. Like most of my friends didn't know I had the boyfriend because he didn't go to my school. What happened to that guy? You know, I'm not 100 percent sure. The last time that I talked to him was probably around the time that I got pregnant with Atticus. It's been probably like over 18 years since I talked to him. And at that time he was like he had moved to Hawaii. And I've like tried to look him up on social media and stuff. I can't find it's really frustrating. There's a couple of people from my past that, like, I'm like, how do they not have an online presence? <laughs> like, I can find, like, a snippet here and there of, like, an old address, but, like, I can't really find them. I don't know. It's like they don't exist if they're not. I mean, like, I have, there's one guy that I'm like, where is this guy? Yeah. What happened to him? I want to talk to him. Yeah. Like, I want to see what happened. That guy in the book, though, how much older than he was? Was he the new? He was three years older. He was right. 16. He's 16. He's shooting up a 13 year old, mm-hmm. which is like, trem- it's just crazy. I know. It also, all this stuff shows me your predilection for 90210 because it's like, <laughs> it is like crazy California junkie yeah. 90210. Yeah. And when you talk about, um, like using your sexuality, mm-hmm. but then being shamed for it, mm-hmm. it makes me think of like, bad boys versus good boys yeah. like like that's a bad girl thing right to use their sexuality and then right. be shamed for it right so like but see i didn't have that i didn't have that persona with like my friends at school or with my parents or with you know like at and with like horseback riding and cheerleading and volleyball and all the things that i was involved in double you know, life I, shit. I had like straight a's i had yeah i really and that worked like compartmentalizing things. I mean, I think part of my attraction to drug addiction was like this ability to have a secret life where all of that crap that I held in all day could go. And that's also like why you're organized and by the book and mm-hmm. you're like, like you looked at the headphones and you're like, which one is supposed to go on the left ear? I was like right. the opposite. Like right. I was just, so, I, I still am. I'm such a mess. Like I'm so all over the place. And I all like, as soon as I started doing drugs, I like just, my parent, my parents couldn't see me really anymore. Right. Like if I showed up, I was just such, a, I was such a mess sober right. that like, you know, as soon as I started doing heroin, everything I owned was burned. Like literally, right. I was just a disaster. Right. When did it become every day? So I mean, actually, before we get to yeah. when it became every day, 
you had a boyfriend, and I think it was pre every day mm -hmm. that tried to poison you with phenobarbital in the well, spaghetti. Was, so okay, yeah, I wasn't doing heroin at that time. So between like thirteen and fifteen, I was using heroin. There were times when like there were a couple times where I was using it every day, and then like I'd back away from it, and I would I was like, oh, I'm a little dope sick. But like I, in my experience, like when you first start using an opiate, it takes a while to get that. Like you don't get strung out immediately, right? After you've been addicted to it, if you relapse, you get strung out again really fast. But then it like took a while. But then in the years that I wasn't using heroin, I was taking so many pills and doing crystal meth and you know dropping acid and like ecstasy and everything else and always a lot of pills, 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 pills. Like pot and alcohol. What Ver pills? I would take Vicodin. That was very con like easy for me to find. It was like always around. You were always Vicodin. opening up everyone's medicine cabinet. Every time I would go into somebody's house, I wouldn't take the whole bottle. I'd go and I'd take a couple. And I'd have a little thing in my purse. So I always had pills in my purse. I'd take any kind of benzos. Any, I mean, when I was really little and did it, it was anything that had a drowsy label on it. But then as I got older, I knew what things were. It was mostly Vicodin. I mean, I'd take it if it was codeine too. But any When did you opiate. stop looking into people's medicine cabinets? I mean, after, I guess after Atticus, I mean, after I got, you know, sober while I was pregnant with Atticus, I didn't, I didn't look in medicine cabinets anymore. It's the, it was the greatest thing to be using and look in someone's medicine cabinet find and find something. It's like the people, greatest thing in people, the world. And people who were, aren't addicts often have like leftover medication from surgeries and stuff. I mean, I do right now in my house and it's been sitting there for two years. You know, it's in, I have like a medication lockbox just because I have kids. But I mean, like, it's just like, that's what's the, that's the miracle that like until this conversation, like, I don't think about the fact that it's there, you know, then I was always on the lookout. But yeah, so I was always taking pills. So yeah, I had this boyfriend who's older, first guy I lived with, and he was a musician, but like his night, like he had a night job where they'd go and do inventory for pharmacies. And <laughs> I knew that he stole pills from work, which was part of probably my attraction to him. And I was a nightmare. I was 19. I was crazy. I was cheating on him. I mean, like, I, it's not a shock to me that he tried to poison me. I mean, I probably would have tried to poison me, too. No, but you, like, that's crazy. I know, I know, I'm kidding. But in, like, true, like, my friends would always joke that it was like that, there was, like, a film, like, I Love You to Death, where, like, they, like, poisoned spaghetti. Like, he literally poisoned my spaghetti. And, yeah, he... He, like, made it look like like crumbled up Parmesan cheese. No, it was top. in the sauce. Ah. So, and I got really sick, but I just thought I had like the flu or something. I really did not think he poisoned me. And that was the last time we ever spoke. And he was like, because we were still after we broke up kind of like hanging out and I was going to go up to San Francisco. And he's like, I don't think it's a good idea because I'm afraid I'm going to kill you. It's <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> what are you talking about? And then he confessed and told me that he had put 30 phenobarbital in that dinner. I don't know how much of the 30 I That's consumed. crazy. Like, so he was murderous. Do you think he's killed anybody since I've then? I've thought of that. What's really funny is that, like, not, I guess, was it on, I mean, this was a long time ago now. Like, I found him on MySpace, and, like, he lied about his age on MySpace and was still, like, had, like, this, like, music page or something, still living in San Francisco. But I thought about looking him up again just to see. He was so weird. Dude, it's like, if, if some woman, like, if I'm with a woman and it's not working out, I just don't see them. Yeah, you don't he, poison them with, with pheno, and you're wasting drugs too. It's two things that don't make sense. You're, you're you're wasting phenobarbital and like you're committing like a serious crime. So crazy. And I said, I'm like, I'm like, did you want to kill me? And he's like, I don't know. I just wanted you to shut the fuck up. And wow. I was like, wow. And then I thought, like, the, the, what's funny? I mean, it's funny. I mean, my friends were joking. The big joke amongst my friends because at that point, like, people people knew that I was like taking pills and like I, some of my close friends were like well it's a good thing you had such a high tolerance to pills it's true it's true probably though we saved your life but he had, we'd had one other weird thing happen like a month before the poisoning where we were talking and I was kind of like leaning over my bed backwards and he was like holding my hands like we were just talking and he just let go <laughs> and I had to go to the hospital I had a concussion because I hit the hardwood floor my bed was fairly high, and now I'm like, we're well, not now, but like at the time, I was like, I wonder if he did that on purpose. Too. He's villainous, very. I mean, like poisoning you is is really. It's really fucked up. It's I know. crazy. It's, I, know. I, I was like, I was, re I was like, what? I was like, I how did this happen? I know. And I told, I remember, I told my parents after the fact, 
real casual. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, you know, he tried to poison me. Like, he told me, blah, blah, blah. And my parents are like, what are you talking about? Of course. it's <laughs> cr- That's another thing, though. Like, and I don't say this in a judgmental way, yeah. but you came from money mm-hmm. in a way where, like, you didn't have to do anything. Like, and I say that with all, yeah, you know, <laughs> with all I hear peace you, and yeah. love. Um, like, fucking, they give you apartment. They give mm-hmm. you this. They give you that. Do you think, how much do you think that played a part in just pushing the whole thing along? Well, certainly having the financial stability and and having all of those basic things taken care of. One, it allowed me to stay hidden much longer. And number two, <clears throat> it, it took me longer to sort of hit hit certain like I don't want to say bottoms but like certain like points right you know when I had that bad crack relapse and my dad cut me off financially I mean that was when I just like literally pawned everything in my apartment and robbed your parents yeah well but I think that's really relevant I I mean like one of my friends that died like it it his name was Todd and Mm -hmm. it happened right off of enabling Right. You know what I mean? Like he was in, in whatever, a mm-hmm. uh, sober living house. And then he went home and they bought him a car. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't want to blame his parents. Right. But it's like, I think all that stuff plays a part. I mean, I was enabled. You know what I mean? I was I enabled mean, it's, all over it's the place. tricky because like, I, I also believe like that, you know, when I, after that, like bad relapse where I pawned everything, my mom, I went and stayed with my mom for a while. We like sold the place that I was living in. And I think my dad gave me like $40 a week and then like gas money and that I had to, so whatever I wanted to buy, whether it was cigarettes, food, whatever, that's all I had, which was not, that's not a lot of money. No. (laughs) And, um, this was like 2001 and, um, that was good for me. You know, I, of course then like, bought he did end up buying me a house after that and you know I there was still that cushion there that said when I had Atticus having that cushion enabled me to get help that I really needed so it's like a double-edged sword because yes there are ways in which I was enabled but then at the same time I'm so thankful that when I finally was able to really get wanted to get help for myself that they didn't turn their backs on me and that they helped me like access psychiatric care and therapy and those sorts of things i'm so grateful for that i mean i think in my opinion the the reason that there is so much relapse is because there's no fucking aftercare for people right and and i think in your situation, and it's a really fortunate one, mm-hmm. that Atticus being your bottom, but mm-hmm. also being like this hope and this yeah. reflection, it made it so that you could use, you know, the benefits of having a family that that had means yeah. and also like love. Yeah, you let it work for you. But yeah. it, I mean, like that's why that bottom was like really fortuitous. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, like I think the thing that I, the two things that I probably feel I mean it's not even shame anymore but I feel like I regret or that I used drugs while I was pregnant and when I bought drugs from a child like a 12 year old and those like maybe even more so with the buying why because I just you know tell that story so when I was on that horrible like crack relapse this is like the end of 2000 I was in Rhode Island visiting my dad and had found a dealer um, I was with my boyfriend at the time and, uh, oh, yes. yeah, <laughs> and, um, w- we found this dealer. He, we went back for Christmas after Thanksgiving and, um, he wasn't answering the pages. And so we, I just went to like, he worked around at this market around the projects in Providence and I couldn't find him. And I was at the same market kind of looking for him. And this kid came up to me and he said, you know, are you looking for black or looking for whitey? And I was, that's what his, his name was. I said, yeah. And he's like, I'm his, his uh, cousin. And he's like, he got shot. And I saw that there were like candles. There was like a vigil. And, and then he's like, what do you need? So I asked him, the kid was like 12 years old. And I bought drugs from a fucking 12 year old. I think you did the right thing. I well, really, I really do. I know that sounds wrong, but I think you did what well, you had to do. It's not. It's not that like in that moment anything would have changed for that kid. It's just that I, 
I, in my opinion, like, you know, sort of the, 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 um, the effects of the, the drug, drug epidemic in America is not just the users, it's also the whole ecosystem that people who are mostly black or Hispanic are caught in. And poor. And poor, yeah, it's a system of poverty and racism, right? And that this is the, that, that they are just as much victimized from this whole ecosystem. And I just, I felt, it just made me feel shitty being a part of it. Do right. You know what I mean? Sure. But that being said, you were, you were using yeah. and he had what you needed right. and you gave him money yeah. and that's that because you needed it. Right. You know, um, I, I think I had a dealer, my first heroin mm-hmm. dealer was like 16. Mm-hmm. And I was probably like 22. Right. And he would come to my apartment and I was like, I, I, I felt a, a way about right. it. But at the same time, I was like, I was just so happy you come to my apartment with drugs. Right. You know, and I, I don't, re- I, it's like, that's nothing that washes up against me now. I think right. it's unfortunate. And I agree with everything yeah. that you said. I just don't like, that's, that's as far as I go with it. Right. I, I mean, I have, oh God, when I think about the things I did, I don't really have, I mean, like, I think that was like kind of one of the weird things about Dopey in the right. first place is that me and Chris would go over shit. Yeah. And like, I mean, we didn't like that we had harmed our families. No, of course not. I mean, I don't like that I hurt, that, that, that there was anybody that I hurt, you know, and, and, but like you said, I mean, look, there's nothing I can do. I can't go back and change it. And there are, you know, there's that thing of like, you know, I say it in the book, like that Mark Twain co- quote, like tragedy plus time equals comedy. It's like, there is something like the ridiculousness of the situations that we found ourselves in and like that it is fucking funny now you have to laugh at it right and when you said that in the book you were talking about the crack story on the plane yes. so please tell the crack story on well, the plane well this is also coming back from Rhode Island with that same boyfriend from the 12 year old crack from the 12 year old crack yes <laughs> and i we get on the plane and i have the brilliant idea that i'm just gonna go smoke a little crack in the bathroom and like you can't you know obviously you can't even smoke a cigarette in there i don't know what i was thinking what were you high on when you got on the plane heroin so you're you're high on heroin Mm -hmm. you're on the plane and you're like you know i could really go for a little crack (laughs) right now so i go into the bathroom and smoke crack and then i'm like paranoid then i go back in and smoke some hair or no i think i snorted heroin and then i go back in and smoke a little more crack and i was like up and down and back and forth and then i thought that the flight attendants knew and that i was convinced i was going to be arrested where were you blowing the smoke i don't i guess i was blown i think i was blowing into the toilet yeah well that's what you have to do that's the move the toilet yeah and you know i think maybe like i had you know it's not it isn't the same as cigarette smoke. It dissipates much faster. But it smells, so it, smells it smells more toxic. You know, it has yeah, that chemical. But you know, it's not a smell that someone would recognize unless they... Unless they were crackheads. So maybe the stewardesses because, were crackheads. Because I don't even... But I don't even think that they knew. I think it was all in my head. You know, I was like... Because I'd go back to the seat and I kept waking up my boyfriend and he's like, oh my God, like, just stop. Like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> And then we like, I mean, that was the worst period. I mean, I was like hallucinating. I was so suicidal and I just, I hated crack so much and I just couldn't stop smoking it. Right. And, and how did, what was the end of the crack run? Was when I went to rehab, I had called that, I had called the ex-boyfriend Pete who, and asked him, right. told him that I needed help because he was the only person that I had really been honest with about it. You know, I, I always like stories, like my favorite stories are, um, like when you're super sick mm-hmm. and then, oh, and God. then, and then you find, Oh bed. yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to read a little, a little <laughs> passage of one time that happened to you and you were at the Plaza hotel Yes. <laughs> and you were a mess. Okay. Uh-huh. Off to the bathroom. I went, I clutched my purse and my sweater together like a makeshift life raft, the bathroom down the long carpeted hall past the painting of Eloise past the chocolate shop past the gift shop was empty the bathroom attendant was at the door and I couldn't look at her I stood in front of the mirror and I faced myself maybe I looked too thin shit the last time I weighed myself I was 110 but I think I've lost more weight since then I'm only 5'8 and there are plenty of models who are 5'10 and weigh less but you're not a model Aaron my long dark hair looked greasy Even though I'd washed it that morning and it was in a ponytail, I could see my heart beating in the vein in my neck. The bathroom attendant came up next to me and placed a towel on the counter. We made eye contact in the mirror. There was familiarity in the gaze. I looked down and turned on the water, but I didn't wash my hands. 
I know her eyes. I was pretty sure she was the same bathroom attendant who had been there for years since I was a little kid, for as long as I could remember. I turned off the water and looked up again. She was back against the wall, but still looking at me with sad eyes. The circles under her eyes were almost as dark as mine. I wondered where hers came from. I felt like throwing up. Sitting down on the toilet, I put my head in my hands and wept. Fuck you. I felt hot. The sweater came off. As I began to fold the sweater in my lap, I noticed something stuck in the rolled collar. Slowly, I unrolled the collar. Boom. How is this possible? It was a piece, no a chunk, of tar heroin. Relief and a little guilt washed over me. I pulled a pencil case out of my bag. I kept my gear in there, organized in a pink plastic box with Hello Kitty's benign white kitty face on it. I took out the small spoon and lighter, grabbed the water bottle from the purse, and poured a little bit into the spoon with half of the heroin. I heated it and plopped the tiny cotton ball in the liquid before drawing it up into a fresh needle. I didn't care if the woman outside knew. It was like junky Christmas. It sure was. It was. Yes. I mean, like, that that really was, like, the best. I mean, and I can't believe I walked around all day taking that damn sweater off and on, and it was, like, stuck in the rolled collar. It was it was a gift. <laughs> Listen, it, it, junky Christmas, like, even, like, talking about medicine cabinets. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I've told this story on Dopey. I'm just going to say it quickly. When I got with my daughter's mother now, mm-hmm. and it was the first... Like she invited me and she was pregnant Mm -hmm. and she invited me for Christmas Mm -hmm. with her family who didn't know me. Mm -hmm. And we and they always go to their friend's house for Christmas, Mm -hmm. which was like this like ultra, you know, goy house, like Mm -hmm. with like scented candles and gingerbread houses and shit (laughs) like beautiful, Mm -hmm. old timey Christmassy. Everything is old wood. And I'm not even strung out. I think I was just feeling bad. You know what I mean? And I like went up to the bathroom and I wasn't a medicine cabinet guy because I never found myself anywhere where I could open one. (laughs) And I go into her medicine cabinet and it was just Clonopin and Vicodin. And I was like, like, this is the greatest thing that ever. I I still (laughs) think Merry Christmas. Right. This is the greatest (laughs) thing. Um, It's just funny. Like that phenomenon for a sick person mm-hmm. to find something that saves them. And I talk about that mm-hmm. all the time, but I think that's a weird thing for, I mean, like it doesn't happen outside of drug addiction. Right. That one thing is the answer to everything. Right. I mean, and that's the, you know, part of like sort of the like psychic psychosis of being strung out is that even when you're trying, you're in so much physical and mental discomfort when you're kicking that like, knowing that there's one little action you could take that would take it all away is is just such a mind fuck it it really is i'm i'm desperately trying to find my favorite quote in this book and i don't think i'm going to find it so i'm just going to try to mention it if you tell me what it is like what it is i could probably find it for you it's this thing <laughs> you said um you were struggling i mean the book is a lot of boyfriends and a lot of drugs <laughs> but this one quote it was like you said it was then I realized that I wasn't a drug addict, but I was a person with uh, I was a, with mental illness right. using drugs to medicate it. Like, mm-hmm. you weren't a drug addict like the boyfriend. No. Like, and I think that's like, what page is it on? So, well, I don't know the page, but I can find it for you. I think what I said... I have it earmarked. He was, he was chasing a high and I was chasing a low, right? He was racing towards a high. It might be right there. Is that it? No. Here? It's, no.
All right, we found it. Um, Jack got a call from, and, and, and uh, Aaron was dating this musician. His name wasn't really Jack, but we'll call him Jack. And uh, was he a famous drummer? He's a drummer, yeah. Was it the drummer from Nirvana? No. Okay. Uh, Jack got a call from his lawyer. A big royalty check was coming in. If he hadn't gotten that call, I would have kicked him out. I could barely stand the sight of him. He'd become a symbol for the growing black hole inside me. The black hole filled with heartbreak over Pete and the abortion and the relapse and Jack's general lack of awareness of just how strung out I was. The biggest difference between me and Jack was that he was a drug addict and I was a mentally ill person pretending that drugs were the problem. Most of the time I convinced myself this was not, this was not true, but increasingly all I could think about was the invisible gun or the ledge on the roof of my building or the box cutter that could do more to my wrist than it did to my leg. I couldn't recognize the blurred lines between the drugs and my depression and the trauma from sexual abuse. All those things melted together and became the filter through which I saw myself, the monster. That's tough. Yeah. But I it mean, makes me wonder, though, like, what drug addict isn't medicating? Like, what is, like... I mean, that's the thing. It's why, like, I don't... Look, like, there are people who I've known where the disease model of addiction fits, right? Where I see... I've There are people I know who I've seen them take a drink, and it's like, whoosh, like, you see the light switch go off. But I think for a lot of people like me, like heroin saved my life, which is crazy, but it did at a certain point. I would have killed myself. I think a lot of people, especially when you talk about like the opioid epidemic and people who started on on pills and switched to heroin, they are people invariably who were in emotional pain. Right. That's why they're taking (laughs) painkillers. And I think that that which aren't designed for emotional pain, though, they're designed for physical pain. They are, but they they work for they they work for emotional pain by sort of deadening your senses and deadening the level that your emotions can go up and down. Right. All all I mean is that like when they design Oxycontin or Vicodin or Percocet, they're not like this is going to make somebody feel better who's depressed. Of course not. Yeah. It's just that thing of like you're giving yourself enough of a cushion from your nerve endings, really. Well, I mean, I used it because I'm an acute neurotic, you mm-hmm. know, for real. You I want f- your brain to shut the fuck up, right? <laughs> I, like, just, I, I, I just really wanted to not give a fuck. Mm-hmm. Like, that's all I mm-hmm. wanted. I, I mean, I knew my whole life that cool people didn't give a fuck, mm-hmm. and yet I cared about everything. Mm-hmm. But I think the thing that you just said is is more important that – you think you probably would have killed yourself mm-hmm. from depression mm-hmm. if you hadn't found the outlet of heroin. Right. I mean, that's really interesting and deep and sad. Yeah, and that's not that I think that depressed teenagers should go yeah, use but, heroin at Aaron, all. Are you saying that depressed teenagers <laughs> should use cure. heroin? I have the cure. No, I just think, you know, most drug addicts use, you know, there's so many people I know that tried drugs, even heroin in the 90s, like late 90s, who did not become addicted. And the difference is, is that, that people who, most people who become addicted to something, it's because they're treating something else. I just, I mean, I, I think that you'd be hard pressed to find a large number of people who didn't have under underlying anxiety depression some sort of mental health issue or and or trauma right it's 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 like there it is a soup though you know what i mean like somebody could have had a physical trauma and it actually finally is something that makes them feel better like supposedly kurt cobain had his stomach was all fucked up so it had major depression of course right but i'm saying it's a soup you know what i mean it's like he could eat Certainly. because he took heroin, but he also didn't have to think or but, like. But I felt this way too because I always have fucked up stomach issues. But you know, like the gut and the brain are super, super connected. I mean, just in terms of like the same nerve endings um, that like uh, serotonin works on are in the brain and in the gut. That's interesting. Yeah. See, I loved. I didn't like how heroin made me feel at first, but I really. I, by the time I got addicted to it, mm-hmm. I felt a lot of pressure in my work. I right. felt like. I, I really felt like finally this was treating, this was making me tr- feel the way I wanted to feel. Mm-hmm. And um, cause I was such a stoner before I mm-hmm. became a, a heroin addict. Um, 
but then I literally turned on everybody, you know, just, and, right. and my personality like changed and I became a total asshole, but it did provide the relief that I wanted. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's interesting that we even go down that path that heroin prevented you from killing yeah. yourself from depression. I, ne- I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that. I mean, it's why I think like, you know, when people I talk about like talking to kids about drugs, I mean, like to me, like the first way that you start talking to your kids about this shit is talking about feelings and regulating emotions and identifying feelings at a really early age because I felt like nobody would understand what I felt right I mean and that's a very common feeling especially for adolescents like they think nobody's ever felt the way that they felt before and so like what I did with what I've realized like with Atticus and when I've talked to like other young people to me, it's like just sharing sort of like what you struggled with as a kid. Like, oh, yeah, when I was eight, I got super anxious or I started having panic attacks or whatever the thing is. It it gets that door open where they're like, oh, wait, maybe they do understand. And then as they get older, like talking to them about, you know, coping mechanisms that end up harming you. Right. right. Because that's what it was. I mean, it was a coping me- It was a maladaptive coping mechanism. <laughs> right. Totally. I mean, for me, like I, I didn't do heroin until I was 23. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I didn't smoke weed until I was like 18. Mm-hmm. And I used friendship to keep me from right. myself. Right. Like I was around people all the time. Yeah. And then when I was like 18, I wasn't around friends mm-hmm. and it hit me. Mm-hmm. And that's when it all started. And it's right. just, it's just weird. Like, because obviously friendship should be a good thing, but right. it becomes this weird codependency where you're right. relying on people so you don't have to think or feel right. unless you're alone. And then it's like these scary thoughts and mm-hmm. stuff. Um, it's interesting. How did you get off in the end? Of drugs? Yes. I mean... You're like, what? <laughs> I mean, ultimately it was... So I, when I was pregnant with Atticus, I was like, I found the doctor who would detox me and I was like, okay, I'm going to stay off of drugs through this pregnancy. I did not have faith that I would stay off of drugs once he was born. I wanted to, but I didn't have faith that I would. And the reason I wanted to is because they didn't fucking work anymore. Like that relief we were talking about, I wasn't really getting the relief anymore. I just didn't know what else to do with that feeling. Like I'm going to jump out the fucking window. So that was, that was like, heartbreaking in a different way like the 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 shitty fucked up thing i was doing that at least provided me with relief didn't work anymore you were 29 yeah i was yeah 29 i had just turned 29 and you had gotten pregnant and you had tried to stop so many times so many times and you would stop and then you would hide it and Mm -hmm. you would use and you would start i took took dirty cakes i mean like i was (laughs) dirty cakes i don't think i've heard that before either do they give cakes on the east coast they They don't don't. so on the west coast in 12-step programs they call it they give you a cake on your yearly sober i know i was i was so jealous about the fact that nobody had given me a cake that the dopey nation Facebook administrator sent me a cake for my oh, sixth anniversary. That's so sweet. It was amazing. Well, I'll remember for next year. <laughs> Delicious cake they sent. Yeah, I mean, I, that, so yeah, I took dirty cakes. I was like, yeah. When did you? Who did you like? Okay, you take I a took dirty several cake. Several dirty. Cakes. Okay, but you take a dirty cake, right? And, <laughs> and who I do was you tell? High. Who do you tell? I didn't tell anyone. But it's so fun to say dirty cake. So when right. did you get to say that? It's not dirty cake. Isn't in that book. No, I no, I think I say I t- well maybe I didn't say I took. You dirty didn't cakes. say dirty. I took dirty uh, cakes. Yeah, well I did. That's a good phrase though. Yeah, so you know the when I relapsed when I had like ten months and then I had that overdose that bad overdose. So I took a dirty cake like shortly after that. Describe the with overdose. my with my bank robber sex worker sponsor sponsor. Did you wind up telling her? No. I mean, after the fact. No. Never. I never told. I I think like I ended up getting a different sponsor. I mean, I was a I was like I mean maybe at some point she knew I relapsed. I don't really know. I don't remember ever coming clean to her. It's so frustrating to me, like. The idea, like, I, I couldn't do that, okay? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I couldn't hide anything, yeah. and I couldn't yeah. live with it. You know what I mean? And it wasn't like a conscience. I just couldn't. Like, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do it. What's it like? Describe it's this. It's awful. Right. It's so, because, you know, I mean, I was a really good fucking liar. I was a really good liar. I knew how to, like, I knew how to shoot heroin and go into class at USC and, like, speak French. Like, I knew how to do that right 
con, the con, the, the getting the, over yes, the whole thing. Yes, and like I mean, I just think of that like my when my like, way I went to rehab the first time, my fiance caught me. He didn't fucking know I was using drugs like that and people were like how how and i'm like i don't think you understand like He's how like, good Sacre i was bleu. he was <laughs> <Yeah>. friends <laughs> oh he was so mad we're still friends though <laughs> um but i was to the overdose yeah so i had I, it wasn't the first time that i used during that relapse i had been using like kind of chipping for a couple weeks like just using here and there not really strung out yet and it was because I, this girl who I'm still really good friends with, and she's been sober now 18 years, over 18 years as well, who in the book is Diana. I knew she was, like, I suspected she was still using, and I went into her work to see her and, and then kind of finally got her to admit it and then told her that I wanted to get high. And she's like, I don't want to help you get high. And I got her on heroin. I introduced heroin to her life. And then I finally convinced her. So we'd been using together. And then I went to her house one day and I don't know, it wasn't a particularly big shot. I don't know what it was. I mean, she did a shot right after me and didn't overdose. And I just went to lie down and then like, I was just like out. And then the next thing I knew, I just remember like kind of just being like, I just had like weird thoughts going through my head. Like I was half conscious. And then I just kept hearing like a noise that was like, sounded like a fly buzzing near my head, like a buzzing noise. And then I'd kind of like, I don't know if I was, I must have been opening my eyes. I'd get kind of like a quick glimpse of light and like motion and then it would go away. And it was her, I mean, she did rescue breathing. She was on top of me screaming. So I woke up to her like literally on top of me, like hysterical. I had like, you know, the bed was completely wet. Is that why you didn't shoot up after that? I never shot up again, which I think is pretty, like, I can't believe I did like I did it like I didn't shoot up again. <laughs> I know. I think that's weird. I, I think it I, is crazy, I, I, right? I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not the greatest reader in the world because I, I do remember and I, and I read half the book yeah. and I listened to half the yeah. book and I heard the overdose story yeah. and I was like, okay. And then later on, I was like, why is she smoking all this dope? Right. Like, why is she wasting all the dope? And then now I'm realizing what it was. And it wasn't even because I didn't want to kill myself, but I realized that. She was so, I mean, she, if she talks about it now, she still fucking balls. Like it was, she says it's like the most traumatic thing she had ever gone through. Well, you like died. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I thought was really fucked up in the book was like, you're clean Mm -hmm. and she's clean and she calls you to check on you and you're like, I want to get high and I'm sure she's going to talk you out of it. And then she shows up to get high with you. I didn't expect that to happen. Our relationship was very codependent, you know, and I think like a lot of my relationships when I was using the the people who were involved in my using, I found people who would be very codependent with me. I mean, she was always so afraid that like if she wasn't there with me that I would go shoot up and die. Like she was so constantly worried about me and it was was not healthy. I feel, you know, I mean, I've of course apologized to her a million times and made amends. And she's like, no, she's like, it's not, you didn't like force me to do anything, but I feel very guilty about that because I really was very manipulative. And I knew that if I told her I was going to go get high, that she would go with me. Right. It's funny. I, I only had, it was my friend Todd who I, and I had another friend who I used a bunch of heroin with and then he just left. He was mm-hmm. like, I'm not doing it. Um, but I mostly used alone or like Me with too. weirdos, like, like with strange people, like that would just come to my, we'd like go cop together on mm-hmm. 14th street and then go to my apartment. So most of my using was alone. She was one of the few people that I used with. And then I had a couple of boyfriends. I mean, I really just the one that I had like a lot of using with. And then in the end you got sober you got sober before you got pregnant, though, right? Well, yeah, but then I relapsed. But, but so, like, when I was pregnant, it wasn't like my worst relapse. But I was, I was physically like, I would have to kick to to stop. And and during the pregnancy, mm-hmm. that you went to Chicago. Was that the Chicago one? So, well, that was it was before that. There's so many relapses I know. in the book. So forgive me. Yeah, no, no, no. It's okay. So no, this was. I mean, this was when I was with Atticus's dad. And, you know, our relationship was so unhealthy and he was like cheating on me and like whatever. And he seemed like the biggest womanizer in the world. When I before I met him, like everybody was like that was their warning. They're like, he is a total womanizer. And I was like, I don't know what I in my head. I'm like, oh, I can handle it. Or like I felt like it was a challenge or I think it was because you did the same thing. Well, also, I think, too, that I picked, you know, I definitely there are times when I picked partners where like. 
I knew it would fail because then ultimately it wasn't was your less, fault. There, but there was also less at stake for me because I go, I went in knowing that it wasn't going to work. Right. So when you go into a fucked up situation, you don't have as much at stake versus going into a situation where you're like, oh, I'm like, this is going to be it. <laughs> Right, right. And you knew that with somebody like him, it wouldn't have been your fault. It would, it's like, it couldn't, it would, it couldn't have worked. And if it did work, it would have been fate. Right. So in the end, I mean, you were so in and out so many times and you were putting so much effort in, but like, well, I mean like that rehab also, it sounded like it was just famous people on that rehab. How did <laughs> well, that I happen? I felt like I was like the only, well, there were, I get so the musician's assistance program map put a lot of people there. Um, I don't know. You had George Clinton in there, Dwight Yoakam, (laughs) fucking Keith Richards on his fucking latest shit. But it was funny because there was three, there were three people, there was like a country singer, the like indie guy and the funk singer. And like, it was so, I just remember like, it was so surreal. On a scale of one to 10, how famous was the funk singer? I'll tell you who it was after this. No, but on a scale of one to 10. I mean, it's like a name everybody would know. So like, I mean, like not somebody. Is he still alive? No. Is it Rick James? Shut the fuck up. You were in fucking rehab with Rick James. He's dead. You can say it. Yes, I was in rehab with Rick James. Did he say cocaine is a hell of a drug to you? No, he just told, I mean, he was, he, he, he was actually really, really nice. I'm sure. (laughs) I mean, he, and he was somebody who kind of like had done it all, seen it all, but, and he didn't die that long after it. And somebody else who was in there with me died within a couple years of being there too. Did he play music at all? Yes. So, like, so, so the night that I arrived there, the funks, Rick and the indie guy and the, um, the country singer, they were all like, there was, we had bungalows there. And one of the things at the, the rehab that I was at, it was an old, um, you know, behavioral health hospital where like back in the twenties, like stars would go to like dry out and or address mental health problems. And there was one, one of the little cabins that was had a wider door and the story was, I don't know if this is really true. This, this guy really was there. Orson Welles. Uh, I'm sorry. It's not, no, it's WC. Fields. I don't know why I said Orson. It's Wells. okay. It's WC. Fields. It's okay. It was the WC fields <laughs> cabin because the door had to be made wider for him. Well, was Orson very Welles large. was very large. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why I said that though. Very different. But, um, yeah, so they were on the porch of the, de- I was still in like the little detox bungalow and I was out there smoking a cigarette, talking to the nurse and I could see them at the WC Fields porch and they were sitting there playing music, like a couple of them were playing guitar and they were like f- just fucking around. And I was like, remember thinking like the- it was like really weird summer camp. <laughs> but it was, you <laughs> yeah. know, but it's like my rehabs. I was like the, the idiot with the guitar. You had right. fucking Rick James and God knows who else. <laughs> And you know, Rick James was in a band with Neil Young in the 60s. I didn't know that. They yeah. were in a band called the Minor Birds before Crosby, Stills and Nash. Mm-hmm. And they like, they got a deal with Motown. So, mm-hmm. you know, I would have been Rick James's worst nightmare in rehab because I never would have <laughs> left him alone for a second. Like, did he talk about the assault, that whole thing? He didn't the know. The kidnapping? No, 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 no. Uh, I wish Mm-mm. we could like get a fucking medium in here and we can do a dopey with the ghost of rick james i know oh. he was just really he was like he was like the dad in there at the time i think I'm he sure. may have been the oldest person in there at the time and he was cool he was very cool everybody i mean like i didn't have any there wasn't anyone i met in rehab who was not like that that was like mean or like shitty why didn't you put his name in the book oh, i didn't put anyone's name the but only- that's rick james I know. Well, there are other famous names I could have put in there, too, but I didn't do it. I mean, you know, number one, for legal reasons, because I'm talking, especially with some of the people where I'm talking about drugs, like, you know, it it makes your legal process with the publisher a lot easier if you just change names. All the names. And also because, you know, to a certain degree, like, I'm... It's not my story to tell, right? I, he's, I'm not going to tell his story. I was just fortunate enough to guess who it was. Yes, you were. <laughs> now, I feel like compulsive that I need you to say how you got sober, but like I know well, you said got, it. No, well, how I got sober was that I stopped. You know, I stopped. So I had I had made the commitment to stay off until I gave birth, and like, you know, the simple version is that I made that commitment. I didn't really feel connected to, to being a mother. I didn't. I, thought I'd be a shitty mother. Everybody else thought I'd be a shitty mother. And then like the second that I looked at Atticus, I had, there was like this familiarity there and I just looked at him and said 
to myself, like, you know, or said to him, you know, I love you more than I hate myself. And it was a very powerful feeling because I'd never felt, I never felt a love for someone before that could abate the self-hatred I had. And, you know, I follow that up with saying like, that's not how I stayed in recovery. I stayed in recovery because I had financial and emotional support and access to care. And I think it's really, really important because there are a lot of people who give birth and that doesn't happen. And it doesn't mean that they don't love their fucking kids at all. But I also think you're selling yourself a little short when you say that, because yes, you had access to care and yes, you had love and money and all that stuff, but you were on a mission to not fuck it up. I looked at him and I was like, I'm not going to leave you with that fucking legacy. That's what I thought. Like I I wasn't going to kill myself and I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to be on drugs. I just wasn't, I didn't want to do that to him. And that was like the impetus. And that doesn't mean that I didn't feel like killing myself. Like, especially in his early years, I was still like, kind of like all over the place. Right. right? You know, he heard me when I was, when he was a little kid say, I wanted to kill myself. I feel horribly about that. You know, we've talked about it. Like I've encouraged him to talk to his therapist about it because that's horrible messaging for a kid to hear. I told my daughter that this morning. Now I feel guilty. <laughs> no, I'm just, just um, I mean, it happens, but like, but you know, in a lot of ways I grew up, you know, I was learning how to be an adult for the first time. Sure. No, I, I get it. I mean, like, uh, I used for the first bunch of years of, mm-hmm. of her life, but I knew that I couldn't keep going. Yeah. And I got very lucky that the bolt hit me and yeah. I was like, okay, now, you since you've struggled with depression mm-hmm. the whole time, that's something else that you really talk about mm-hmm. in the book that you you take medication for it now, mm-hmm. and I think it's really important to like share yeah. that because you also talked about like taking Wellbutrin and being like it's working now I'm gonna stop. Oh, I did it so many times, and that's what I'm on now. I take Wellbutrin, and like you know, for me, like I honestly like in the years of like speaking to psychiatrists and everything, I think it's like I probably have more of like a personality disorder than depression because everything's so. I'm one of those people who, who had like, I would get like, I wouldn't have like long sustained. I mean, I, I, yes, I would be kind of like sort of like a low level depressed, but I would have like, not quite like bipolar where I was having like manic episodes or anything, but I would be like risky behavior, like combative, you know, wanting to push people away and then, you know, having to sit on my hands so I wouldn't jump out the window or grab a knife and like stab myself. Like that kind of like the rashness of, of like my suicidal thoughts were, were always like things that would have been like a split second decision rather than like methodically planned out, which is more like a personality disorder. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because the medication is working. It just prevents me from going to those extreme places with my emotions. Does it help with extreme impulsivity as well? Yeah, it does. I'm so impulsive. Like, I mean, I'm, look, I'm still a little impulsive in certain ways. Like, you know, like I, I just am. That's like my personality. Like where like sometimes I'll say something a little bit impulsive or like I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy that thing where like it's stupid. Like, why am I buying that? That's like filling some dumb hole by I think, oh, I'm just going to buy that because it's going to make me feel better. Those kinds of things. But not re- I mean, not in like the destructive ways that it was before. Right, right, right. Like I'm not, you know, like. I'm not blowing my life up all the time, which right. is what I was doing before. See, I think it's important that you make that distinction. Yes. Because I'm impulsive about a lot of stuff, but nothing that's like no. life destroying. I'm not going and like, you know, fucking people. I'm not going and like gambling my money away. I'm not doing, I'm you know, I'm not doing the shit to blow up my life. <laughs> right, right. But I think it's also like, I, I, there was a quote that I read, like when I was deep in my mm-hmm. addiction and like, I didn't see an end to it and I didn't want an end to it. Yeah. Like I, I, I didn't mind. I mean, like I was miserable, Mm -hmm. but I was like obliged to the misery. I was like, this is what I'm doing. And I, but I, I, I would go to meetings here and there and I never liked it. I was like, this is annoying. I can't do it. I would see therapists and I just would say, I don't, I like how it feels. I Mm -hmm. don't want to stop. And then I read something in some book that talked about the phenomenon of aging out of it. Mm-hmm. And I think when you talk about not wanting to blow up your life, it's because when you're young, you like don't have that much of a mm-hmm. life. And it doesn't matter if you blow it up because you blow it up all the time. And it's like, that's right. what you're used to. Once you cultivate something, the consequences are so much different. Right. The collateral damage is like, whew. it's crazy. Like yeah. imagining like what blowing up 
your life like now would be or me blowing up my life now it's like it's like i like my life Mm -hmm. like and it's like i'm not particularly tempted by drugs right you know Uh, i have fantasies about being an old stoner sitting on my porch and such but they're fantasies right you know i'm not tempted right um because my life is too good like why would i want to add something to it that's going to fuck it up right when's the last time you think you felt any kind of temptation and be totally honest. I mean, it's probably more like, I think like last year at the beginning of the pandemic, I felt like, I felt like those weird urges, like I wanted to harm myself. Not, not in the way that I actually thought I was going to do it. That's, that's where my head goes more now where it's like, God, it would just be easy to like not be here anymore. Okay. You know, I still have those passing thoughts. I'm, they never get very far for me, but just having them feels crappy. And it's the, weird. It's a weird thing. Like I felt that like old feeling like of like, I wanted to like tear my skin off. Like this was like last May, like, yeah, last April, May, I felt very shaky. And so, but the difference is, is like, I told my husband, I told my best friend, I called my psychiatrist and we talked about it and he upped my medication a little bit. That's the difference, right? Like, and also gave me some sort of like, cognitive tools and then you know like the beginning of this year when i felt like oh i'm disassociating a little bit more i'm like i'm gonna try a little emdr like you know i think that's where like the security i have in recovery comes from is that it doesn't mean that i don't ever have times where like i fantasize about blowing up my life like just like taking off or like i mean you know whatever the thought is but the difference is is that like i don't do it when you say though, when you say that you notice more disassociating, like what mm-hmm. does that mean exactly? That means that like I'm not connecting with the people who are closest to me. Like with my husband, I'm just like not really there. Right. And um Where are you if you're not there? Like what are you associating with or nothing? I think I'm just like, I, I, I'm just like, I distract myself with whatever it is. Like whether it's just thinking about something else or just like sometimes I just check out. Like especially when it comes to like intimacy, like I can just kind of like check out. But, you know, like then, you know, like my husband can sense that for me. And that's, you know, like that's like my old shit that comes up, right? It's like this because of the 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 scariest thing for me always was really emotional intimacy right getting close to you yeah i still have a big problem with emotional intimacy you know my kids have helped with that so much you know the first time that i think i really felt like sort of like next level emotional intimacy was with atticus and uh and it's allowed me to be, you know, I'm way closer to, you know, the people in my life now than I would be then. Because then, even if I would, oh, I'd like, to, I'll talk a lot and like be open, but I wasn't really letting people in, you know. I hear you. I, I hear you. It's 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 very good stuff. Now, would you say this is the greatest podcast you've ever? This been is on? the best. It's actually the most fun <laughs> podcast. Well, good. And I'm so happy we were able to do it in person. This is really cool. Yeah, but before you go, yes. first of all, you know about the... And we didn't talk about 90210. I can't believe it. I used to watch <laughs> 90210 and just like, you know when Dylan was trying not to use? Yeah, I was using. Yes. And I was like, Dylan, just fucking take the shot. I wanted him to, I wanted him to stay high with me. I would like beg him not to get clean. Well, I so like for years I watched it in like reruns too. Like I watched it four times a day. Me too. I would watch the On two the in the morning and then whatever, I'd yeah. FX and then I'd yeah. watch the two at night and I would stay high for all of them. I was like fucking sick and I didn't watch it in high school. I hated it in high school. That is so funny. I, was, I, I watched it in high school, um, but I became more into like it was like it's for whatever reason it's one of those shows like I still watch it like in the background all the time like I have it on just it's like, a heroin show for me it's like when I was a kid right. no but when I was a kid I hated it That's I so resented funny. it like yeah. I resented these cool guys and uh-huh. these good looking women and I was like fuck them and then when I was all strung out and like a disaster on yeah. heroin and benzos I was like I can watch this. Yeah. And I was like, and then I would watch it with Todd and I, and we would make fun of it and Todd right. lived for soap operas. Right. So we'd laugh at it, but like 90210 Futurama. I don't know why it's a cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. I watched that on heroin. Uh-huh. I can't watch it. I could. And, uh, what's another show like that? 
I feel like I watch Taxi a lot on heroin. Yeah, oh, that's oh, that's sad. I know. It's such a beautiful show. Yeah. You're a TV person. I'm to- I love TV, yeah. Thing about Taxi would be like, at night I would watch Oz on mm-hmm. HBO, and then I'd watch Seinfeld, mm-hmm. and then I would run out to cop, mm-hmm. and I would come home at the end of Taxi, which was on after Seinfeld, mm-hmm. and I would just get the music, and yeah. I would have the dope. So I would associate right. the dope that, with that incredible that music. I remember watching Oz when it was on. Yes. Like, so high. <laughs> Me too. I live for it. I, li- I live to get high with the characters yeah. on TV. And Sopranos too. When the Sopranos first started, I think I was using. Well, just so you know, you're sitting in the chair mm-hmm. where Michael Imperioli, Christopher sat yes. and reenacted the scene oh. in the car where he relapsed. Oh, that whole, his whole storyline too. Because when he was like, struggling i was struggling <laughs> me too i lived for that so he came over mm-hmm. and he didn't want to talk about addiction right like we talked about he wrote a book about lou reed right and uh he yeah he wrote a book about lou reed uh, a novel where lou right. reed is like one of the central characters How funny. it's weird that's awesome and it was before he did the talking sopranos mm-hmm, podcast mm-hmm. and he came over and i had i i my dream was you know the scene with christopher and the junkie yeah. in the car and yeah. he's paying the junkie and he's like, I don't know what it is about that, that whatever he says that makes, makes me, oh, what, I don't know what it is about that spike right. that makes me feel whatever, whatever. So I, I contacted the junkie, mm-hmm. right? The guy who played the junkie. And really? I was like, I was like, could you come on Dopey and we could reenact the scene? And oh he's like, God. no, I'm not doing it. Then I contacted Michael Imperioli after months of craziness. Right. He came over and I was like, well, I always wanted to reenact this scene. <laughs> And he was like, I'm not doing it. And I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, I'll be Christopher and right. you can be the junkie. And he agreed to do it. That's so cool. Okay, now I have to go back and listen to that episode. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things I ever got to do with my life. Now, before we go, yes. on fir- you know my mural on First and First? Yes. They painted over it yesterday. I'm walking down the street. The film crew painted <laughs> over it. So we're trying to get that back up. Uh. Dopey Nation, stand fast. Stand by and... <laughs> What are you saying? What does he say? Stand down and stand by. Yeah. Is, yeah. That stand. What is it first? Stand by or stand down? Stand. Stand by and stand. stand da- no, stand down and stand by. It's yes. stand down and then stand by. But Dopey Nation, right. soon we're going to have to start a letter writing <laughs> campaign to get the mural back. But, yeah. but before we go, I want you to read this uh, email. Okay. Because it's a dopey story and it's not even an email. It's this English woman who messaged me on Instagram, this crazy <laughs> long thing. And I was like, why don't you just send me an email? So read it like it's an email. Okay. Hi, Dave. I'm not going to do an English accent. If you can, you should do it. (laughs) I hope you and your family are well. I saw a pic of your family with the dopey sign across your family's eyes, and your youngest looks so much like your dad. My previous messages made make me cringe. I sent them whilst I've been fucked up in booze and coke during the UK lockdown. Me and my partner's habits spiraled massively during this time. My best friend moved in in the midst of it. She needed somewhere to live, and I was tired of my partner's horrendous behavior, and I felt like her presence would help things. It turned out she noticed my partner's secret drinking and coke sniffing when I just thought it was normal. She pointed out the extent of it, and I quickly realized how bad his habit was when I thought it was recreational and out of boredom. Since he has started going to meetings, and it came out that he relapsed quite a few times, he only fessed up because I wanted access to our joint account, and he had changed the password so I couldn't see how much money was missing from our accounts. I'm now struggling to trust him as all the time he was high and I had no idea. Dopey has taught me how relapse is part of the road to recovery. My partner tried to express that his addiction was an illness, but he has more power over his illness than someone who has cancer or even a common cold. Anyone else suffering from an illness has no control how their body reacts to the illness, but people suffering from addiction have a choice to make. I'm struggling with this concept at the moment. I went to an open meeting with my partner, and now he goes regularly. I would have thought it an extreme measure had I not listened to Dopey. I was blown away by how honest people were in front of me at the open meeting. You have inspired me in that you have overcome a lifetime of addiction, and you now live a fulfilling life. You and Linda have a partnership. She isn't dragging you along like I feel like I'm dragging my partner along. I honestly can't. It's so hard for me not to comment as I go. You can comment. No, feel free. <laughs> well, I'm just like, it's so early. Like, of course, <laughs> like you're in totally different places. I honestly can't believe you made it work after such a long time being addicted. It didn't work. We were separated for years. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. like, 
you know, what I always say, I'm just going to interject right here, like with the advice column, I get asked this question a lot, usually by the partner of somebody who's struggling with addiction. And they're like, you know, they've, they've ended things with me and I, I'm just going to stand by them. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, you need to let that relationship go. It doesn't mean you might not have a new relationship, but it's not going to be what you had because what you had was broken. You mean you could have a new relationship with, with that the same old person? Right. Yes, right, yes. Right, right. But it has to be something rebuilt from the ground up. It's not going to be what you had before. It has to be something new. I should have gotten someone to ask you a question, but keep going. Yeah. Well, I can always come back on and we can a- answer people's we'll get, questions. Ask Aaron on Dopey yes. coming soon. <laughs> um, I have a Dopey story. I have a few, but this one is my fave. Mine are mostly promiscuous and under the influence of booze and coke. I was out for my 22nd birthday and I was wearing the most painful shoes. <laughs> Me and my two best friends were out in absolute messes. I was at a bar which was famous for visitors such as Amy Winehouse and the Libertines, and I was feeling most sexy having drunk lots of vodka and sniffing lots of Coke. I felt so good, I lifted my dress up and removed it in the (laughs) middle of the pub. I had a good old dance with lots of attention, and for some reason I wasn't kicked out, so I started going from bloke to bloke asking if they wanted to pay me for sex. I've never sold myself, and I have no reason to. I just felt like it at the time. I went around and most people laughed at me and I just moved on to the next and the next. Well, that was kind of depressing. This gets bad. <laughs> I, if everybody keeps turning you down, I was stood at the bar. I know, but if someone comes up to me and says, Do you, will you pay me? Right, the fuck? that's it's true. Like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like, that's, that's, yeah, not, yeah, that's not yeah. as sexy no, as, yeah, that's, as the no, beginning. No, that's not sexy. No. I was stood at the bar and a guy seemed interested but all along, he was pissing down my leg. <laughs> At this point, I kicked off. Does that mean he was actually pissing down her leg? Or is that an English thing, like taking the piss? I think she means, no, he was it's urinating because it's, it's, it's the next line she says to me. At this point, I kicked off and no one paid me any attention because I was in my undies and heels. I was mostly being laughed at. I carried on and I finally found a guy and his mate who said he would pay to have sex with me, even though I smelt like piss. Aye. She did get pissed on. And I couldn't find my dress. He was telling all of his mates he was going to pay me to fuck him whilst I danced around in my heels and undies. This girl needs a meeting. (laughs) So he took me back to his Chelsea apartment and I became obsessed with him giving me some cash. So he handed some money over and I proceeded to have sex with this guy and his mate covered in piss and fucked out of my mind. So he handed some money over and I proceeded. Sorry. Oh, sorry. My twice. Bad. I hope Linda doesn't mind me describing my worst dopey moment. She but, won't hear. But <laughs> basically worry. I shit all over this guy. It's like my husband's never read my book. Well, I think that's very <laughs> smart. He, yeah. he shouldn't read the book. He was like, I just don't really. He's like, I, he knows everything, but he's like, I don't really want to read it back to back and in detail. And I'm like, fair enough. But basically I shit all over this guy and his mate when they thought I was a seasoned professional prostitute when they were trying to fuck me at the same time. Fortunately, they abandoned ship and I got a shower, thank God, before they kicked me out at 4 a.m. and handed over my well-earned payment. Wow. What's interesting about this is she says that they paid her several times within the story. So what's I don't know when she's going to get the money. No, but what's really interesting about it is that this is her favorite dopey story. I know. That's the best part. I toddled off to my friend's house and slept on her doorstep until she found me at 10 a.m. At the time, I was very proud of the easiest 300 pounds I ever earned. However, it is now my deepest shame. She only got 300 pounds. No, that's like 600 bucks. Well, not anymore. I think. But that, maybe then yeah. it was, and she was wasted. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm kidding. She I'm proceeded. Joking. She proceeded to ask me if I had ever had anal sex, and she didn't believe my answer. And obviously the dude fucked her in the ass and he shit on her. That's what happened there. That's the story. You mean she shit on him? That's what I mean. Right. She shit on him. Yes. I remember, this is gross and I don't know why I'm telling this, but I remember once I was high and I was at, I was at a strip club with like friends of mine and this girl told a story that like she, um, threw up once giving her boyfriend a blowjob and then he liked it and always wanted her to like throw up on him and i remember i just had like this weird thinking that's a really weird fucking fetish that's bizarre (laughs) it's so bizarre i mean maybe i can imagine the warmth being good but the (gasps) smell smell. would trump the warmth i can't like i would throw up like i just the the thought of it yeah well that's a fucking hardcore story that is a hardcore story i don't have any stories like that I mean, I have plenty of stories, but I do not have, I never, no. you know, I no. don't have that story. I've never seen anyone get naked in a bar and ask people to fuck them for money. But I like this girl that she, cause like she carries your message of don't feel shame. Yeah, no, you shouldn't. I mean, listen, like. Her name is Hannah, by the way. Hannah, thank you for writing thank me that you, on Hannah. Instagram. I mean, that it, it's, it's like, you know, you get, you relieve shame by letting that shit out. Literally. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, before you want to do the other one, yeah. but first we have to say there's a woman named Maria Pacheco. Okay. She's in detox right now. Uh-huh. We wish her the best. You can do it, Maria. You can do it. She's a long time dopey Aww. person. And then there's this dude, Justin England, mm-hmm. who's a aspiring writer mm-hmm. and a crazy dopey fan. Mm-hmm. And he always asks me to give him a shout out and I never do. So Justin England, this one's for you. Woohoo! All right. <laughs> and now here's the second uh, dopey email. Seven years dopeless today. I know I should email you, but just a quick thought. Listen to Riley Walker last night. Dave, you do an excellent job at listening to people. I just wanted to say I really love that about you, probably from sitting through so many meetings. Ha. You stay active and engaged without forcing yourself into the story and conversation and allowing people to talk. I think today I forced myself into your conversation a little bit. No, I felt like it was... I don't know. I didn't, right. I didn't feel like you forced your way into the right, conversation. Good. After 300 episodes, obviously that should be a skill you have, but you would be surprised at how uncommon that is, i.e. Rogan. He's saying that I'm better than Joe Rogan. They, duh. That's nice. Like <laughs> yeah, that. that is. I learned a lot, cried a bit. This week in September always feels like trauma week, so I'm super vulnerable. That, and then you sprinkle the dopey salt to my September 14th wound, and it's a great thing. I remember driving last night as I was listening to the episode, thinking of all the things I wanted to tell you, like an hour and a half of things, just like the longest fucking email of all time. Just absolutely worthless shit you hear every fucking day. Then I realized there was only one thing I wanted to tell you. I don't care about people recognizing me for my seven years. I only care about support and congrats, congrats from addicts. Yes, it's awesome that my friends and family support me and love me and blah, blah, blah. That is all nice and good. I care about addicts. When someone who knows what it's like to get their ass to a meeting, when someone knows what it's like to leave jail and shoot up, when the people begging for another goddamn 24 white fucking knuckling hour to hour calling sponsors and really working just to breathe on their own congratulate me, that means so much more. That means the world. And you have six years, and I wanted to say congratulations. Your family loves you, and you have an epic life. I just wanted you to know that seven years without dope is a really long fucking time, and I love you. Sorry this wasn't as short as I thought it would be. Love you, dude. Toodles, Chris, and everyone else we have lost. Nice, and that's Colin. Very beautiful. Thank you, Colin. And I agree with him. I think when you hear congratulations from somebody who's been through it, it's it's like when somebody who's not in it, Congratulations! They you. don't You're, have any idea. It's just like I kind of don't like it, right? You know, I mean, you have to like it, but I feel a little bit like they're placating me, right? Like a little bit. They're like, right. "Oh, it's so good that you're not shooting dope right. or whatever." It's different, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The truth is that I wasn't going to use your episode until next week, right? But I heard you're going on Amy Dopey Dresses podcast on tuesday and i was like we got to get this up before her i love that i, I love it too I'm, I'm sick i'm a sick person it's, it's but it was it was beautiful to have you over and i think your story is incredible and dopey nation look for the ask aaron cut what we call them segments coming up yes on dopey where and where can where's ask aaron going to land it lands at on my website, erincar.com, E-R-I-N-K-H-A-R.com. You can find it through all my social media, which is just my name. Aaron Carr. And what about the fact that there's Aaron Lee Carr? Does that I, bug you out? Not re- Nobody ever really confuses us. I did. You I, did? I did for years. I thought you were David Carr's daughter. I was sure <laughs> I guess that. I would have been much cooler if I were. <laughs> no, no. I just think it's interesting. Because I was also, Aaron, Aaron Lee Carr was supposed to come on in mm-hmm. September. Mm-hmm. And I had some conflict. I think she's going to come on in October. But isn't that fascinating? Two of you. With I know, but different spelling. Totally different. And she's spelling. got the, at least she sticks that Lee in there. What's your middle name? Kathle- Lee. Kathleen. <laughs> Lean. Isn't that funny? You Kathleen. Be, you can be Aaron, Aaron Lean Card. <laughs> and your book is called Strung Out, yep. and it's great. I recommend. Oh, dude. Oh yeah, the giveaway. Yeah, right? Aaron, we're going to give away some books. So what do you want to do? What do you want to give away books for? <sighs> God. How many books do you want to give away? Let's give away five. That's a lot no, of no, books. No, 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 no. Let's give away seven books. Why? For your seven years. I only have six. six. For his. No. For Colin's seven years. No, we'll then. do six then. Six I want to do mine? six for your six years, years of better. sobriety. All right. So this is what I want you to do. If you want a copy, paperback or hardback? Paperback. If you want a... Signed. Signed. And she signed mine, which is maybe You have to live good. in North America, though. I'm sorry. So no English, no Australians. No. If, you, if you're in England or Australia, I could send you an electronic copy. What about Canadians? Canadians, they can Let's get, remove yeah. Canadians from no, this, No, they can too. get one. Oh, okay. Fine. <laughs> so if you're in North America yeah. and you want a copy of Strung Out, write 
dopeypodcast at gmail.com mm-hmm. and do an Ask Aaron question. Yes, perfect. And okay. you can ask me about anything. The tagline of the advice column is she's made all the mistakes so you don't have to. People write to me about addiction. They write to me about relationships. They write to me about family problems, like everything you could think of. Like no question is too weird. There it is. No question is too weird. Aaron, thank you for coming on the show again. At the end of every episode, we say stay strong, dopey nation, and fucking toodles for Chris. Toodles for Chris. What's up, Dave and Chris? My name's Jake. I'm 25 years old from West Virginia. I just found Dopey about two weeks ago, and it's my favorite podcast of all time. Y'all are hilarious, and it's just gotten me through some really hard times. And Though I'm not clean myself... You know, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. Um, I really like Dave's song, and I'm going to do a little cover of it here on my banjo. Hope y'all don't mind too much. I wrote a uh, third verse myself. Sorry about the poor quality. It's just on my phone. And, uh, sorry about the banjo. This thing's hard to keep in tune. <clears throat> Get some honey in my pockets and I guess I'll just have to walk around my neighborhood and I want to be good so bad Wanna be so good, so bad, so bad I want to be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had Wanna take a ride up in the sky Watches airplanes just pass me by And I want to see a Learjet liner take a dive Just to show all of these people what it means to be alive I want to be good so bad I want to be so good, so bad, so bad I want to be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had in a burned out basement listening to the dopey show the Home friends I had her on this little radio I keep checking on my pulse because it feels like I might die But the thought straightening up sounds so much better when you're high And I wanna be good so bad I wanna be so good, so bad, so bad I wanna be good so bad Bad desire's all I ever had Well, I hope y'all hear this Makes it through the, uh Big inbox emails. Feel free to play a clip on the show if you want. I, if not, I know it kind of sucks. All right, uh, really appreciate it. Thanks, y'all.